Okay, guys, so we had been looking at GIF and JPEG, and um, we didn't really go into PNG so much. I don't think so, no. PNG is another format that we would consider to be standard. <coughs> PNG is basically 24-bit color, pretty much uncompressed. It's certainly lossless. And PNG files tend to be very large. PNG also supports transparency, um, and it has you can have eight bits worth of transparency, so you can have degrees of transparency. So, so your JPEG you're talking about compressing using the discrete cosine transform. It's good for natural images. GIF uses, as far as you're concerned. The main thing it's doing is run length encoding. You can only have 256 colors at max. Once you have those, it's, it can be less, less. But obviously getting to 256 colors could be an issue. It's very good where you have plain expanses of color where there's scope, where there's opportunity for run length encoding. PNG then, you should think of as uncompressed and the pure file without any loss at all. And you can save things as PNGs, but generally that's quite inefficient because they're huge by comparison to the equivalent JPEG or, or GIF. So you shouldn't really be using PNGs. What we're going to look at now is video compression. And we're going to look at the ways in which we make video smaller so that it can be transported on the web or you know, stored on a computer. Um, I find it very interesting, so that's mostly the reason why we're doing it. It's also relevant to this, this module. And uh, it contains in it some of the cleverest ideas I think I've ever seen in, in computing. I'm sick that I didn't invent some of them. If only I'd been born sooner. Um, so some very, very clever things in video compression. I need you to stay with me, okay, and ask me questions if I lose you because it gets progressively more complex. The plot thickens considerably. And it's a bit ambitious to try and do this in 40, 50 minutes, but I don't want to dwell on it too much either. So the first thing we need to realize when we're talking about digital video is what we're talking about. So we're talking about 25 separate pictures every second. Do you want to get the lights there, actually? We don't really need them. So 25 frames every second. And then with, with that many images, with that, that frame rate, you have the illusion of motion. Now, analog television was, was considerably more complex, but I don't think we're even going to discuss it because it's dead now. Let's, let's you know, leave it alone. So, cinema uses 24 frames a second. PAL uses 25 frames a second. You know, cartoons, animation can, can use as low as, you know, 12, 13, 14 frames a second and, and get away with it. I sometimes wonder, is South Park like running at, you know, six frames a second or something? But it depends on the, on the context. You can, you can get away with a lot. But generally... You know, for an episode of Game of Thrones or something, you're talking about 25 frames a second, a new image every, every second. If we were to consider digital video, you know, just a, a program, watching a program on the computer, 640 by 480 pixels is probably as low as you would go. Now, YouTube is a bit smaller, but I mean, you wouldn't want to be watching a whole movie, say, at YouTube dimensions. A bit bigger than YouTube, Something that's acceptable to watch on your screen would be 640 pixels by 480. That'd be fairly standard. HDTV would be much bigger. So some programs would be around this, and then some would be much more than that. You kind of sometimes you see, if you have your TV set up so that when you change channels, it tells you the parameters. Some of them, can, it can tell you the parameters, you know, what you're looking at. Or sometimes if you're watching live telly on your computer, if you're watching something, you change channel, and all of a sudden the window would like, you know, double up because it'd be in higher definition. Anyway, 640 by 480 is very modest in terms of digital video. So that would be whatever, 307,000 pixels, if I'm not mistaken. If you've got three bytes per pixel, you're talking that many bytes per frame. And if you've got 25 of those a second, okay, now you're up to like something like 23 ish megabytes 
per second. So if you store video in uncompressed form, even modest dimensions will require huge amounts of data. Now when I started talking about this thing in class years ago, it was very obvious that you couldn't work with those data rates. You could probably get computer systems now that could, but it wouldn't be very practical for, for day to day use. It would obviously clobber your, your iPhone fairly quickly if you're trying to get it to process 23 megabytes of data every second. And it would certainly um, cause problems for your phone bill, your, your mobile phone bill. It would be long eating up your credit at those rates. Okay, so nearly 22 megabytes per second. So compression is, is necessary if we want to get things done. Compression can happen at two levels. There's intra-frame compression and inter-frame compression. So intra means within. So if you were to shift someone in the class, I know it's slim pickings now today, but um, that would be intra-frame shifting. If you shifted someone in another class, that's inter class shifting, okay? Within and between, okay? So intra frame compression operates on a single frame and compresses that. So if you have 25 frames a second and you only use intra frame compression, then you've got 25 compressed frames every second. And you can have that. It looks, it looks very like, like a JPEG, really. Okay? There is an actual format that does just that, and we call it Motion JPEG, or MJPEG. And all it is is one JPEG, followed by another one, followed by another one, followed by another one, and followed by another one. So you treat each single frame as a separate image, and you compress each of those images individually. That's the key point. It turns out, however, though, that one of the main features of digital video, video general, is that not a lot happens in that 1 25th of a second. In fairness, if you got 25 separate images every second, your, your head would explode. So not a lot is changing between one frame and the next. So here to make the point, I have two frames captured from the television. and. These would actually have been taken um, quite far apart time-wise. So they're not even 1 25th of a second apart. If they were 1 25th of a second apart, the, the changes would be very, very minor. This is quite extreme. Now, having said that, it's a contrived example. I mean, you know, it, this is almost the best case scenario for video compression. Not a lot happening, really. Here, I've highlighted the places that have changed. So the places where you see some lightness, there are changes. The places where it's dark, there are no changes or a few changes. So you can see that from one frame to the next, in this example anyway, very little has changed. And that's what inter-frame ex compression exploits. The fact that between one frame and the next, there's a lot of redundancy. And so what inter-frame compression does is it takes a bunch of frames, like maybe 10 frames, and compresses those as a group. So here's 10 frames, I'm going to compress those. And then you send those 10 frames, like as a, as a package. And then the receiver decompresses those 10 frames. So whereas intra-frame compression exploits the redundancy within each individual frame, Inter-frame compression is successful by exploiting the redundancy between the frames. Because there's not a lot changing between one frame and the next. So you really get the idea. So you really see what I'm saying there. So if you get that, you're, you're most of the way there now. So very little changes between one frame and the next. So if we take frame 3 here and frame 4, we see that not a lot changes between one frame and the next. So if the current frame, the current frame can be constructed, or parts of it anyway, by copying and pasting portions of the previous frame. So if we look here at frame two and frame one, 
the portion in red there hasn't changed between one frame and the next. And it's only the portion highlighted in blue has changed. So if you're transmitting frame 2 from A to B, the transmitter doesn't need to send all of frame 2. Having sent frame 1 to the receiver, the transmitter only has to say, well look, you already have frame 1. Frame 2 is the same as frame 1, except for these, these changes. Some parts of it are different. Here are the different parts. And specifying those changes, those differences between the frames, that takes up an awful lot less data than sending the entire frame. In this example here, it looks like it's about maybe a, a fifth of the, of the data. So the transmitter would say to the receiver, here's frame one, yip to do Then the transmitter would say to the receiver, now frame two is the same as frame one, except the bit down there in the bottom right, that's different, and I'm sending that now. So I want you to copy and paste the other parts from frame one into frame two, and then add them to, to this part here. Yeah? So wonder that doesn't slow it down, with it? With the amount of thing going on. So a lot of um no. don't do this, do this, do whatever. Is it just send it? It turns out that figuring out what to send is very hard work. Mm -hmm. The transmitter has an awful lot of work to do. The receiver not so much. Mm. Figuring out that only this part has changed <coughs> is hard work. And figuring out how to specify you kind of, someone said to me in another class, is the receiver really just, is the transmitter so just sending instructions on how to make the frame? And that's a good way to think of it. You know, it's sending instructions on how to assemble frame two using parts of frame one and some additional data. So, frame two is the same as frame one, but with these small changes. Frame three is the same as frame two, except for these parts. Frame four is the same as frame three, except for these parts. And so coding the difference between the frames takes a lot less data than the actual frames themselves. Now it turns out that if you were to address each individual pixel in an image, the addresses of the pixels would be so long you wouldn't really um, gain anything. So what we do is we break the current frame up into blocks and then we specify block by block whether it's changed or not. So in this example here, only the blocks that are, have changed are even are significantly different. You probably even have a little threshold. So if it's only been a little tiny, 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 tiny change, you might say, eh, leave it alone. And if it's a significant change, then you'd send the new block. So the blocks that don't change are copied and pasted from the P previous frame to make the current frame. And then the blocks that need to be sent then are sent. And so you could see how in one twenty-fifth of a second, you know, maybe not a whole lot is, is changing. Any questions? If you do, get them in because it gets, gets to the point where it's going to wreck your head. No. This now is where it starts to, to get hairy, okay? So, if we look here in the current frame, and we look at the, the fourth last block, and then we look at the equivalent block in the previous frame, we can see that it's completely different. So, like the trees up the top there, and the tree up the top left, you know, those blocks are the same. So the transmitter would be saying to the receiver, you know, block one is the same, just copy and paste that. Block two is the same, just copy and paste that. Block three is the same, just copy and paste that. And away you go. When it comes to this fourth last block, the temptation is to think, well, we've no choice. We just, you know, send that block because it's, it's changed. But the interesting thing is that although the fourth last block in the previous frame is very, very different from the fourth last block in the current frame, the information we're looking for in the current frame 
is actually available in the previous frame, it's just moved. But it is there. The bit we're looking for I've highlighted in green there. So imagine the receiver, the transmitter could say to the receiver, block one is copy and paste that, block two is the same, block three is the same, block four is the same, copy and paste all those. And then it comes to the fourth last block, it's saying, okay, the block now you need is in the previous frame, but it's moved to the right 20 pixels and up four pixels or something. And so it does copy and paste the block from the previous frame to construct the current frame. But it's the job of the transmitter to figure out where it is in that previous frame and tell it. You know, you know the information that each block does that stay exactly the same, it just moves on the same size, same dimensions, same everything. It doesn't sort of We're in we're in close enough territory. We're we're prepared to go you for a mean, close yeah. enough. That block there with that wheel in, would that be actually identical no. block as that? No, one? no, this is a contrived example. In reality, you'd have a threshold where you'd say it's close enough. How many pixels would be in each uh, block? Actually, eight by eight, as it turns out. It was too much for him, he said. All right. Any other questions? So this is called motion compensation. And it generally holds under certain conditions. Okay? So if objects move in a plane that's parallel to the camera plane. So if, um, if, if everybody moved, you know, South Park style like this in the video, then you could see how motion compensation would be would be possible if people are turning around you know if, if there's zooming in and out or there's rotation it tends to break down but you must remember that at 1 25th of a second at that scale it's you know it's still even possible also the illumination needs to be uniform so if a car drives from a light you know if the car is under a street light and it's driving into the darkness well the ability to reuse pixels, reuse blocks from one frame to the next isn't going to be as, um, it's not going to be as handy. And then of course if one object is occluded by another you have problems. So if I'm standing here and then I move over here and you see the bunny rabbit behind me on the chair, well you know good luck trying to construct the bunny rabbit from pieces of my shirt and pants and stuff. You know, Wouldn't be that easy. But you'd be surprised the extent to which it holds. I think it's one of those things that shouldn't work in theory, but works quite well in practice. And obviously, like in a contrived example like this, you could see it. And obviously in an episode of South Park, you could see it. You know, episode of The Matrix or a battle scene or something, it's going to be harder to pull off. But remember, at the 1 25th of a second scale, you know, even in a battle scene, it's probably not a whole lot of um, thing going on no, in that really, really tiny time frame. Any questions on that? So motion compensation allows you to reuse blocks from previous frame in the current frame even if they've moved. And so this orange block here in the current frame when you compare it to the yarn, the same position in the previous frame, it's very different. But the information that we're looking for is in fact there. It's just moved. Get the idea? Okay, <coughs> now, now it gets worse or cleverer. So let's look at the same situation again. And here we have frame two, and we're trying to code frame one. And we compare frame two with the same position in frame one and we can see that that's very different.
However, when we look around, it's not that it has moved. It's not that the information we want to make frame 2 is in frame 1, but it's just moved. It's just not there. Because it's, it's uncovered background. And so you might think, well, you know, okay, finally we have to give up and send the block. But no. Because, sure enough, in trying to construct frame 2 from frame 1, that piece of information isn't there. But it is, in fact, in frame 3. So imagine if you had a scenario where you could construct frame 2 using not only parts of frame 1, but you could also use parts of frame 3. Well then, it starts to get very interesting. Because an awful lot of the data then is going to be available for you. So a system that allowed you to copy data from <coughs> Future frames as well as past frames would be really, um, really successful. So, MPEG uses that scheme. It's called bidirectional prediction. And it has B frames, they're called. And they're constructed by using blocks from both past and future frames. No, if it's not sitting comfortably in your brain, well, the first part is to understand it. Is it you and, then, and then when you understand it, you start to reject it as kind of impossible. Um, go on. I'm just wondering at what stage you're at. We'll see. Yeah. Certainly, for example, if something is purely live, yeah, 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 yeah. If, if, you, if you think of it as being live, for example, it, it doesn't sit so comfortably. So think of it as having a, a video here all made that you're, you're compressing. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't sit well somehow. But do they actually use it? Like yeah, yeah. It has to be delayed then by a fraction yeah. of a second. So MPEG is a standard used for video compression. And in much the same way as a JPEG was devised to end the madness of multiple formats across multiple platforms that were incompatible with each other. And fresh from the success of JPEG, the, the good minds of the day decided to tackle video and came up with MPEG, which is Motion Picture Experts Group. And that's an ISO standard. And it uses I-frames for intra-frame compression, P-frames, the predicted frames they're called, for inter-frame compression. And as we saw, actually, it also uses B-frames for bidirectional compression. So I-frames are standalone frames, and they're not dependent on any other frames. And if you look at the syntax of an I-frame, it's pretty much a JPEG. P frames then are predicted frames and they reuse data from a previous I or P frame. So they can depend on other P frames as well. And then bidirectional bi -directional frames, bidirectional prediction uses data from a past I or P frame and a future I or P frame, but never another B frame. By the time you've constructed a B-frame, it's shabby enough, actually. And you don't want to build B-frames on other B-frames because the, the noise that gets introduced is just too, too much. So I-frames um, are pretty much JPEGs. So you'd expect maybe them to be like a third of the uncompressed size of a frame. And then P-frames are a good deal smaller and B-frames are freaky tiny in comparison to, to the original. And then you have a whole bunch of dependencies set up 
which causes some, some interesting problems. So frame two here is a P frame. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's a B frame. A B frame, right? And it's using parts of frame one and parts of frame four. So it's constructed from, from those two frames. Frame three is a B frame, and it's using parts of frame one and parts of frame four. A B frame would never use as its reference another B frame. So it doesn't use two ever. So three uses one and four, and two uses one and four. Frame four then is a P frame. And so it's recycling parts of frame one to make frame four. Frame five is a B frame. We're using parts of frame four and parts of frame seven to construct it, and then any other extra data that's needed. Frame six, similarly, is constructed using parts of frame four, parts of frame seven, and then also any additional data that, that may be required. If, it couldn't, if something couldn't be for block, couldn't be found in four or seven, it just gets sent. And then frame seven is a P frame that's reusing, recycling parts of frame four. Typically then you start again, you start then every 10, 15 frames. You don't keep going for the whole length of a movie. Do you mean it? You get diminishing returns after a while. So you might, you know, get a new, a new, a new iframe every second, maybe at, at the latest, even that'll be pushing the boat out a bit. No, so that is the, I, the I and the P frame are the main uh, stuff that's repeated most on the frame. And the B is so that the, 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 the slight movements. Or is the iframe more so the background image type of thing that's mostly seen? No. It looks like no. the, 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 the I and the P are the ingredients, but the B frame is the one that's changing mostly. No. The answer to your question isn't no or yes. The answer is really that the question doesn't make sense. I'll get a yes one day. Yeah. <laughs> um, it just seems to be like just a, com a combination of the two. If you're getting loads of B frames, but you're not, you're not getting any more ILP frames, ILP frames, you know? Um, let's look at this here, so no. Frame two, right? If you imagine it like a jigsaw or a collage or something. Mm -hmm. There's blocks being copied and pasted from frame one in order to construct frame two. And there's some blocks from frame four being copied and pasted into frame two in order to construct frame two. And then there may, block, there may be blocks that weren't available in either one or four, and they're just transmitted. Okay. So in terms of instructions, in order to make frame two, the transmitter is saying to the receiver, OK, block one. You get that in such and such a place in frame one. Block two, you're getting that in such and such a place in frame one. Block three, you're getting that in such and such a place in frame one. Block four, you're getting in such and such a place in frame four. And the next one is in such and such a place in frame four. The next one is in such and such a place in frame one, whatever. You might be saying this block here is um, the same as the in, is in frame one, whatever. But, but no new B-frame looks for any information from the previous B-frames. It doesn't recycle parts from a previous B-frame, no. But it's not, it's not to do with the... What you said. <laughs> yeah. It's, so it's like recycling from, from 1 and 4. This is a bit then where some of you were thinking ahead and realizing that it does not compute, okay? So we're transmitting the sequence. We send frame one, and then we send frame two. But frame two is constructed using parts of frame one and parts of frame four. So how can you construct frame two unless you already have both frame one and frame four? So you have to send frame one and then send frame four. So frame four then is constructed by reusing parts of frame one and maybe some additional data that's required. And then you can send frame two 
and frame 2 uses parts of frame 1, parts of frame 4, and some additional data that may be required. And then you can send frame 3. So only then, next up then is frame 7, isn't it? And then what? 5 and 6. Okay. So it turns out that the frames need to be transmitted in an order that's different from the order in which they're going to be displayed, which is a bit of a head wreck. So if you're sitting on the data stream, you're seeing frame 1, frame 4, frame 3, frame 2, frame 3, I say right, frame 7, next then 5 and 6, and then maybe 10, and then 8 and 9. So the frames get sent in a funny order because of the dependencies between them. Okay? But is that the way that when we send packets in uh, open network, we've got an idea on them and, and these? And yeah, it's so. Just yeah. Them for you yeah, them. so like that then. So then the receiver then puts them back together in the right order and displays them. It does mean if something is live, it'll be, you know, a fraction of a second delayed. But that was going to happen anyway. It also has implications for noise propagation then. Because of the dependencies, right, if we lose, say, this frame here, that's frame one, two, three, four. So frame four gets lost you know, uh, a bird hits the dish or something while that's being sent, or the packet just gets lost. Well, then that has implications for frame two, because that relies on it, and frame three relies on it, so now they're both damaged as well. This P frame that was relying on frame four is also damaged, and the B frames that relied on that are also damaged. And so before you know it, you know, there's a lot of things gone. So that's another reason why you don't keep going indefinitely. You restart every so often. So, so it's not very, um, it's not very, it's not very friendly when it comes to loss. If some data is lost, it can the the consequences of that can propagate. But of course, that makes sense. I mean, if you're reducing all of the redundancy in the data. Then if you remove some of it, you're going to have consequences. But that's kind of how you know you, the scheme you had was, came up in the, in the first place. You know what I mean? Like old analog television, if you lost you know, a frame, well, it was just that frame. Because there was no dependency, because there was no efficiency. So that's, um, that's something to consider with, with MPEG. So any questions on any of that? So you now know quite a lot about video compression, probably more than most people. Um, someone was to ask you, I mean, I think if you ever see an exam question, obviously you won't be having an exam question, but any exam question I ever saw about MPEG or any explanation of MPEG, it's all about these dependencies here between the frames. And if you can <coughs> understand why all those arrows are the way they are, then that's your, your laugh in there. That's not how we should receive it, like, receive it like maybe like on Sky TV and nothing knows it. That's completely different. Yeah, no, this is what we Sky would be using now, yeah. For some time, for many years. I just thought that Like was RTE good. would only have, I mean, digital terrestrial television would only have started in the past, what, 6, 12 months now at this stage? Well, no, it started about 2, 3 years ago, but yeah. they turned off the analog signal only recently. But Sky has been using this for years. Yeah. Satellite was using it for years and years and years because, um, first of all, it was kind of, it's very expensive. Bandwidth to space is kind of pricey, you know, so it made sense. But also, the delay in implementing it in terrestrial television sooner would have been the cost of the receivers. But with a satellite dish, there's a receiver cost anyway. So Sky went digital long, 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 long time ago. I mean, many, many years ago. I think I was in college at the time. Because, of course, once you have stuff digital as well, then you can start encrypting and things like that to make it all easier. 
but that's sort of official. What, what's, what's the benefit of having things like API? Like if you try to copy something to API, it's so big. Well, AVI just might be an older format. But also with any, with any of these, I mean, there's, there's variables you can tweak. So there's a program, for example, Handbrake, that you can use to compress video. And you can go in there and set in the advanced options. You can say how frequently you want your iframes. You know, you can even specify in some of them the order of the iframes and the P-frames and the B-frames. Things like that. Um, so there's another one, H, um, is it 264 or 246? I always get them wrong. That's another standard. But they're all using variations on this with just different um, parameters and, and different constraints and different settings. Now, there are newer, there are way newer um, ways of compressing video. But like, like JPEG, the way this was done was designed to be implementable with the technology at the time. But also, MPEG just specifies the format. It doesn't say how you, it specifies the structure of the video. It doesn't specify how you get it. And that's an important thing, an important feature, because it allows the technology to advance um, without having to keep update the format. Now, there was an MPEG-2, um, which was a slight improvement on MPEG-1. It was still much the same, though. And MPEG-3, interestingly, didn't happen. And then MPEG-4 was delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. We now have MPEG-4. Um, MPEG-4 is, is very different in that it focuses kind of on having different streams and being able to mix them together and stuff. So I, I, the main way I try to explain MPEG-4 to people is that if you imagine someone standing in front of a blue screen reading the weather and there's text on the bottom of the screen, in MPEG-1, that's just a bunch of pixels being compressed. In MPEG-4, you might find that um, the blue screen behind them is one stream the video with the presenter standing in front of it may be a different, completely different video stream within that. The text on the bottom may actually be sent as text, you know, as ASCII, and they're all combined at the receiver into, you know, so that's theoretically possible in MPEG-4. And generally, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Um, MPEG-3, or MP3 as we know it, is the audio part of MPEG-1. So MPEG-1 had three layers. There was one layer for the video, one layer for the audio, and one layer for the synchronization of the two of them. And MPEG-1 layer 3 is what we know as MP3. So we didn't actually know we needed a standard audio compression format until we got one. And then we realized the things we could do with that. Any questions on any of that? I imagine I've run over time, <coughs> have I? Is, is there really much difference between like an the MP3 there, whatever, 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 do you know with the JPEGs, right, when we had like quality at 80 and quality 100, and you couldn't really see the difference that much? Well, it's the same with audio coding. Like the first, you know, 56K bits per second give you the most of it. As you increase the data rate, the returns become diminishing. You know, like if you if you have if you have um, an audio file, and let's say it's um, or even he is um, let's say you've got 256k bits per second for your MP3. You're coding at very high quality, right? The first 128 of that is doing you know nine tenths of the work, and the next 128 of that is going to give you the last 10 percent. 
you know. It was very interesting because in the early days of iTunes, you could pay for, you know, super duper quality or not so duper duper quality. And but the human ear is so slight you can't it. Although do you know what I got I got new headphones recently and you'd be amazed how much stuff is there you didn't realise was there. Beats. You know. Well no, not that new either now, but independent that kind of money. But um but yeah, like the each new amount of data is going to give you less benefit. And the trick is finding the, the sweet spot, you know. I mean, certainly, if you could pay a euro for a song on iTunes that was 128 k bits per second, and then pay two euro for a song on iTunes that was 250 k bits per second, I think that's bad value. Because in terms of an improvement in quality, or improvement in perceived quality, you know, the extra data doesn't give you as much as the, as the first half, you know. So it's hard to hear but you can visualize it in, in JPEG when you change the quality settings and look at the file size. You know, more does give you better, but 100% more data doesn't give you 100% more quality, whatever that is. However you might measure it, we couldn't, we, it would be hard to find a measure of it. But even if we could agree on one, we'd probably find that 100% more data doesn't give you 100% more quality. No. Which is that, but the 128 and, and, the, and the higher ones there, like you said with the headphones, yeah. it's actually the headphones that are tuned to, to a certain graphic that makes it sound better than the actual what's delivering, you know what I mean? Well, there's quality, there's quality parameters in the headphones as well, and then there's also just the um, how much the bass and things like that are, are turned up, yeah. you know. But, um, I've you, I've no, 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 it's very relevant. Okay. It's very relevant. Um, so. I don't think we'll get time to look at audio coding. It's really a whole other module, you know, but uh, it's all very interesting. Well, the HD but quality would be the same The what? The HD quality. They would use the same techniques, yeah. but with a HD movie, there's just more pixels. Yeah. It would still use 8x8 eight eight blocks. There's just more of them, you know. And then within each block as well, I mean, remember we said, like, you know, you s resend the block or you don't. There's like a, you know, you compare the blocks and see if they're the same. I mean, you can have a, a quality threshold, you know, that you'll turn up and down. So if there's only a tiny change in the block, you might say, well, it's good enough to reuse. But you can set your quality so that even if this is a fairly big change, you might still reuse it. You know, you can turn the, there's all these different parameters you can turn up and down. And also, I mean, you can have a digital video stream that's just JPEGs. It's motion JPEG. Even in an MPEG stream, you could just have, you know, all iframes. So that would be a perfectly valid MPEG stream. It would just be all iframes. And obviously that would look better than one that used lots and lots and lots of B frames. But again, the size wouldn't be, wouldn't be that attractive. So it's a trade-off. Um, generally for broadcast, you know, I mean, there's no point in, in Sky or the BBC having a huge image and then coding it crap, you know, so, um, but, you know, you see, obviously, if you, if you, you know, another, I mean, YouTube doesn't, um, YouTube is all concerned about getting it to you, and the, you know, the bandwidth available may be quite, quite small, so YouTube videos, obviously, first of all, they're really, really compressed, and also, they're still quite small, they wouldn't even be 640 by 480. There are many, are there? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's that. Any other questions? Great stuff, guys. Thanks.